Michelle Fassett. So if you're already here, you probably already see the broadcast message that Jason sent in the waiting room. There's a paper for you to download to have it ready um, beforehand. So right now I'm going to give the stage to Jason to do a quick introduction about ASPB. Great. Thank you so much, Shale. Um, before we begin, um, I want to um, welcome everyone uh, in our um, essentially very first webinar, a Bonte webinar in our series for 2023. Um, and so happy new year to you all. Um, my name is Jason Padilla and I am your technical, technical host for um, today's webinar. Um, this webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the online community for plant scientists, um, by plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. Um, I would like to give a special thank you to all our ASPB members who are attending today. Um, your ASPB membership um, dues help support making this webinars um, possible. Um, I also would like to um, um, give a special thank you to our speakers um, as well. Um, for any of you who have not um, joined ASPB yet, um, you can join today and, and using the discount codes for Centen, you will receive a 10% um, discount. Um, members um, also get um, early access to this webinar and, um, and so and you can learn more about ASPB and opportunities at ASPB.org. Um, um, in addition, um, next slide. Um, in addition, um, please be sure to check our YouTube channel where you can find many uh, of our other exciting talks. Um, and so this um, webinar will be up um, um, posted on our channel once it's done. Um, before we begin, um, next slide. Um, before we get started, I'd like to go over um, a few housekeeping items to make sure that you get the most out of your um, webinar experience today. Um, if you're experiencing technical issues, um, please let us know. Um, you can um, put those in the chat um, to me or you can email me at jpadilla at ASPB.org. Um, and if you have questions for our guest speakers, um, please add them um, to the Zoom um, Q&A section. Um, Jawe will um, be sharing them with our presenter and go over them um, during our Q&A time. Um, if you're um, having um, trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that the recording again of this webinar will be made available on our YouTube channel. Um, please be sure to follow Plante YouTube channel to receive notification when new content is posted. Um, so, all right, um, that's enough for me today. Um, I will now go over uh, and turn the floor over to Xiaowei, who will moderate um, in today's session. So take it away, Xiaowei. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Hui Li. I'm the moderator today for today's webinar. Today, we are going to talk about how to read a scientific paper. Uh, a quick reminder that the speaker today will be Dr. Mary Williams, Features Editor at Plant Cell and Plant Physiology. Welcome, Mary. And Dr. Michelle Fassett, Assistant Professor at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Welcome, Michelle. Uh, I, I, I'm the moderator, Xiaohui Li. I'm a PhD candidate at Purdue University. So a quick, uh, I'm going to go quickly go through our, log, log, our uh, outline today. So first, I'm going to introduce both of the speakers and myself. And then Dr. Mary Williams will give a presentation about principles of reading a scientific paper. And then the second half, Dr. Michelle Fass, that will lead a case study of the select paper. You'll find the link in the reminder emails. Please have it downloaded and at least open so that you have it ready available. And then there's a 10 minutes Q&A. Feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box instead of the chat box so that we can track what questions are being answered. And then Jason will jump in to, to do the concluding remarks. So uh, let's welcome Dr. Mary Williams. Mary is a features feature editor for Plant Cell and Plant Physiology. She is also a principal investigator for the NS funded project of LEAPS RCN called Root and Shoot. It's a very nice uh, uh, NSF program to eliminate the, uh, the uh, system, systematic racism. So Mary spent the first half of her professional career as a professor in a small liberal arts college, the Harvey Mudd College, during which time she was chair of SPP education committee. In 2009, she joined the staff at SPB. She's active on Twitter and also on Mastodon as the, with, with the handle of Plan Teaching. And she, her greatest joy comes from seeing the spark of recognition when she helps someone understand a difficult concept, whether about photosynthesis or the effect of systematic racism. Welcome, Mary. And our next speaker is Dr. Michelle Fassett. Uh, Michelle is an assistant professor at Department of Biology in University of Massachusetts Amherst. The Fassett lab studies the cellular mechanism of asymmetric cell division and stomatal function. 
primarily using maize as a model and using a combination of microscopic protein biochemistry and genetics approaches. Before joining the faculty of UMass in 2018, she was an assistant professor at the University of New Mexico for two years. Before that, she did her PhD work at Stanford, studying plant cell walls and her, parents, and her, postdoc, work, her postdoc work at UC San Diego, focused on asymmetric cell division. She's active on Twitter as Facet Lab. And finally, uh, myself, uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Body and Plant Pathology in Purdue University. I'm a cell biologist in training who occasionally do some coding. I'm currently studying the membrane trafficking process uh, using a combination of different uh, approaches, primary left cell imaging, but a lot of genetics and the computational biology. I'm now a Plenty Fellow, and you can also uh, follow me on Twitter as Xiaohui Li. So with that, I'm going to give the stage to Mary to start her presentation. Brilliant, okay. Can you see, can you hear? Good. Um, so I was asked to be thorough and brief, which is challenging, but I'll do my best. So when we think about reading a scientific paper, um, you know, there's, there's different reasons why we do this. Often I will read a paper simply because of curiosity. You know, oh, that looks interesting. I wonder what that's all about. Um, many of you will be students and you might have a class assignment where the instructor has asked you to read a paper and perhaps given you guidelines for what there is expected. But probably the main consumers of scientific papers are other scientists who are trying to learn what people in their field are doing, but also learn new methods and ideas and, and keep up with, with what's happening. Um, and finally, there's another type of person who reads a scientific paper and that would be a peer reviewer. We'll talk about that briefly as well. But most of the papers that, that I read and that we read have gone through the peer review process. So someone will be asked to provide feedback to the author to help them improve the paper and clear up any misconceptions. Um, so when you're reading a paper, there's a few big questions that you'll be seeking to answer. Um, the big one is, what is the question? What is the big idea? What are these people studying and, and what are they trying to learn? What have they come up with? You'll also be interested in reading about the methods. Are the methods that they're using to ask these questions appropriate? Um, and what are they? And the most important part of the paper, which we'll talk about mostly, is what are the results? Um, you know, what have they actually done? What are they sharing with us about what they've done? And how do the authors interpret it? Which is really what's happening in the discussion. The authors are usually reflecting upon and interpreting their results and trying to say where they think these things fit into the big picture. Um, this is from a, a, an article we wrote a few years ago, and I'll put the link at the end, but it just lays out sort of the structure of what a scientific paper typically looks like. It's got multiple parts, and you'll find these are pretty similar no matter what journal um, you're looking at. So it starts off with a title, there's information about the authors, including where they are. Um, the abstract is really a one paragraph summary that tries to present the entire body of work very succinctly. Um, then there's these four sections, which are the introduction, which gives you this big idea of what the question is, the results, which is really the, the meat, the core of the paper. So what did they find out? The discussion in which, again, they sort of reflect on their, their what they've learned. And then usually at the end, there's a method section that gives you the details of what they did um, and usually references to other papers that will elaborate further on these. And then finally, at the end, you'll find a set of uh, references where they cite other authors who are working in the same fields and also papers um, that, that give more detail about the references. So these are the pretty standard components of a scientific paper. When I sit down to read a paper, I start with the title and then I read the abstract. And it's not uncommon that that's where I stop. I'll think, oh, that's interesting. I have an idea of what they've done. That's all I really need to know. You know, somebody did an interesting study. They found something interesting. Thank you very much. But if I go further, um, I'll skim the introduction. You know, okay, get a better sense as to what the big questions are. But then what I'll often do is I'll go to the end and I'll find if they've drawn a summary of what they think their new findings tell us. And I was trying to think of how to explain this. It's like if you do a jigsaw puzzle, You'll have a picture on the box and then you'll be able to fit the pieces together to make that picture. So I find that really helps me when I'm looking at the data, if I know what kind of idea they're trying to build with these. 
Um, and then I'll spend most of my time looking at the results. And that's what we'll do in my short little presentation is we'll really think about a bit about what are the results sections all about. And then again, I'll look at the discussion, looking back at the figures. I don't usually read the methods, only in case I really need to and have some particular question in mind. We don't really read the references, but they're very handy if you want to look further. And I also want to mention that most papers also include supplemental data, and I'll show you that in a second too. So that's sort of the, the big idea of the structure. And as I said, I'll go into a little bit more detail of some of these now. So again, we're going to focus on the results because I think that is the most important part of the paper. Um, I, I've described the results here as four types of data, and I'll go through each of those. One type is qualitative. Um, these are you know, pictures, they're usually photographs, but back in the old days, people did drawings, the same idea. You know, Here's a drawing of a, the cells in a root. Now we do fancy microscopy, but it's the same idea. So you'll see images of plants, of um, colonies. Here's some images showing different rates of fruit ripening in tomato. This is kind of nice because it's the, the splitting of a root tip and you can see a regular camera a dissecting scope camera. This is a section showing the, the root cells. And then this is using a computational confocal microscope, which gives you really fine cellular resolution and also allows you to track the shape and sizes of cells as they move. And often these qual qualitative data can be quantified. So here you can see that the computer using the micrograph can extract information and present it numerically. The same with these cells, you can see the rate of growth of different cells. Most of the data you look at though will be in some way quantitative. Um, so people will be measuring things, counting things. You might see time courses, dose response curves. Um, you'll often see these things that we call heat maps that show the abundance of a gene expression or a transcript um, in various conditions. So some get higher, some get lower. But the authors, this is part of the requirement of a paper, is that the authors are presenting the results that they found for you to examine. You don't need to take their word for it because they're saying, here's the evidence. Have a look yourself. One of the really important things that you as a developing scientist want to learn is how do you know if these things are really different or if it's just random fluctuation. Um, and there's a, a tool, a set of tools called statistical tests. And we don't have time for that today, but we will down the road be having additional workshops and webinars looking at these different statistical tools because you really need to understand how to mathematically determine if something is really different or not. So keep that in mind that it's coming down the road. Um, these are some examples of these summary picture, pictures, like the, the cover of the jigsaw box, where you can see, okay, the, the authors say, this is what we think is happening with low hormone, this is high hormone, this is how something is changing and the genes are interacting over time. Um, so again, I like to these because they really tell me what the author thinks is happening in terms of with all of the data they've presented. But some summary figures also summarize data differently. So this shows a huge amount of DNA sequence information and each um, arc here shows a chromosome and then radiating out are different species. So what this is showing is they're looking at all of the genes in this family and how they've been conserved or not over time. Um, so that's kind of a summary of a huge amount of information. And then I wanted to include this as well. It's a type of analysis that you might have seen occasionally. It's called principal component analysis. And you can take a whole bunch of different types of measurements and it will show you which parameters are the most important in separating out these different measurements you're making. So getting familiar with the types of figures and data that you will be seeing will be really valuable to you as a developing scientist. I also wanted to mention, as I said, the supplemental data. So you will often see a link that just says supplemental data. And if you click on it, you'll often get a zip file. And in this particular paper that I pulled out, the data included eight figures and three tables. And um, often these are additional experiments that support the evidence that's already in the main part of the paper. 
So it's useful to sort of support it, but it doesn't usually offer new ideas. But if you're very interested in the study, it's a nice way to get additional insight into what the authors did. Okay, so briefly, I just wanted to mention what peer review is and what it means. So traditionally, a paper will be submitted to a journal. It'll go to an editor who will send it out for review. And the reviewers, these peer reviewers, will read and reflect on it and give information back to the author so that the author can clarify things or maybe correct mistakes they've made. And then ultimately, the paper is accepted and published in a journal. And that's the way things have gone for years. We have new ideas coming out of peer review, which we'll talk about in a second as well. So um, the reason I'm mentioning this here is that often journals will publish the comments that the peer reviewers made alongside the paper. And again, it's another place where you can get insights into what other experts in the field think about this research and what suggestions they make. So sometimes when I read a peer review report, I'll see someone saying, this is the most exciting thing I've seen this year. And I think, ooh, that's, that's interesting, right? So uh, it's another piece of data that you can find with a scientific paper to uh, enrich your reading of it. So as I said, there's new models of peer review coming out, and I've just listed a few. You may have heard of the idea of preprints. So um, increasingly, authors are submitting their manuscripts online to a, a host that hosts preprints before the peer review process. Often it takes place in parallel with peer review, but not always. And the, the main one where you'll find biology papers is called BioArchive. That's a chi, a Greek chi. So if you go there, you'll find lots of papers that have come out but have not yet been peer reviewed. And you may have seen this became really popular with the community, the public, during the early days of the COVID pandemic, because this was the most recent, newest information we could get about the virus and its effects and all that. Um, so some of these sites also post uh, reviewer comments. So you can review a preprint and post your review of it online, which is a great learning experience for you, but also a great opportunity. eLife is always pushing the envelope on how publications should happen. And they have a new model called reviewed preprints. Have a Google of it and you can see that what they're doing, which is different. Free review, Research Square, and then the last one here um, hosts a list of a lot of places you can read preprints. So I just wanted to sort of make that distinction between traditional and preprint type of articles. Um, so finally, I just want to say, why should you read a scientific paper? Um, and I think there's lots of reasons. I think the, one of the most important is it because it gives you the opportunity to understand the world. So be open-minded, expand your horizons and read beyond your comfort zone. Whether you're a student, whether you're just generally interested in how the world works, find a paper, read it. Yes, it's challenging. It's absolutely challenging, but you learn by doing it. Uh, as a, if you're particularly, if you're a scientist or just someone who, who cares and wants to avoid misinformation, reading a paper really helps you develop your critical thinking skills. So you can approach it like a detective. I have a little picture of Sherlock Holmes here. Are these experiments solid? Are the data interpreted reasonably? Or are there important clues that were overlooked? So it's very good neurologically for you to read a paper and think about it and evaluate it. And again, if you're a scientist, this is how you stay abreast with the current research, find out what people in your field are doing and learn new methods and approaches that people are carrying out. And then finally, if you're asked to be a reviewer or if you go to one of these preprint sites and volunteer to review, it's a nice way that you can provide your insight and ex expertise into the developing um, paper that's, that's being formulated by the authors as they complete it. So it's a nice job to do to, to help each other by doing the peer review process. And I think that I'm on time and I think that was my last slide. Oh no, sorry, last slide. So this is the, uh, the, the, the resource I mentioned and this QR code will take you to the website. We also have it at the end. So the one PDF is how to read a scientific paper. And the second one just gives a case study walking you through a paper just like Michelle will be doing now that I'm gonna hand the slide, the, the presentation back to her. Um, 
a little guided tutorial for how to read a paper. So that's it for me. I'll stop sharing. And if you have questions at the end, I'll, I'll come back. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mary. Now let's give the stage to Michelle to start her case study. Wonderful, thank you very much, Mary. Um, okay, so let me just orient my screens here. Okay, so I'm gonna give a little case study about how to read a paper. Okay, I wanna make this point. The first thing you need to do is to be kind to yourself. This is tough, okay? And I'm going to assume that most of our audiences may be new, a little bit of inexperienced. Um, reading a paper is difficult, just like doing a craft or doing a sport, doing some artwork. Um, it's a skill that you have to develop over time, and the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. So if you find yourself getting a little bit frustrated, take a breath, take a break, and be kind to yourself. Okay, so before you start, actually reading the paper, part of being kind is to prepare yourself. So you need to download the paper, download materials, give yourself sufficient time. On that note, 25 minutes is not enough time to read a paper, even if I was reading this by myself. So I'm going to not, we're not going to read this paper today. I'm just going to show you the approaches that I take and how much time you take is going to vary. So if I'm reading a paper, um, let's say for journal club, I might take about an hour. If I'm reading a paper that I'm going to do a peer review on for a journal and actually judge how valid it is, I might take four or five hours. And so um, giving yourself enough time, when I was a graduate student and maybe a little bit new to reading papers, I would probably take 90 minutes to two hours to read it, okay? Um, the next thing you wanna do is orient yourself and actually check the figures. And so let's do that right now, actually. I'm gonna get, show you the paper that we selected which is here. And so before I start actually reading the paper, I'm just gonna look at it and what does it entail? So I chose this um, paper as an example um, from Yamin, uh, Yasmin Abraham uh, Juarez, and it's about MADS box dimerization, floral development in maize. And so if we flip through, we can see that anatomy that Mary alluded to. There's the abstract, here's the introduction. Um, Plant cell has this in a nutshell, which I'm going to come back to, which is very handy because um, it has things like the question and the next steps. And if you're new, this is super helpful. Um, it's a little bit different than the abstract. Here's the results, the meat of the paper, and we can see here's a figure. It's got some of those nice um, pictures that Mary uh, alluded to. That's qualitative data that has been quantified. Some graphs down here. Um, figure two, we scroll through. Ooh. Figure two is some scary looking graphs. So I'm just gonna put a pin in that and think, okay, I might have to figure out what's going on here with figure two. If I read it, it's talking about remodels transcription. Okay, figure three, more graphs. Um, and there's also some, oh, I know about these. These are Western blots and co-IPs. I like to know this, so this is good. And then figure four, ah, here's that model that Mary was talking about. Uh, if we look at, oh, these things look like histones and we have some circles, things are going on a little bit different now. Okay, so we're going to be asking probably about gene transcription, um, just looking at this paper. So this is sort of the first step to orient myself. And I'll also go and I'll download the supplemental data. Not everyone does this, but I like to do it and just peruse like, good golly, is there anything interesting in here? Because sometimes there's a whole bunch and sometimes there's not very much. So I'll just flip through this and I'll be, oh, okay, there's some data. And then, oh, these look like a lot of boring tables. So there's, there's some supplemental data here, but not a ton. Okay, so let's go back to my presentation. <clears throat> okay, can, everyone can see my screen again, all right? The slide's excellent. So um, orient yourself, be prepared to take notes. I write all over my papers. And if you look at the paper that I read um, for, for this, I don't know if you can see, but I've got scribbles all over the place. This is very normal, okay? Um, and it's okay to not understand everything the first time through. Sometimes you'll read through the paper and you're like, gosh, I don't know what they did here or why they did it. You read the whole thing and then you go, ah, Maybe this makes more sense now. And you go back, okay? That's also very normal. And it's also, if you don't understand, sometimes, sometimes you go back and you're like, man, I still don't get it. Google is your friend and colleagues are your friend. And especially when you're new, you're gonna tap these a lot, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's look at this paper. Part one, the introduction. So Mary told you that she usually just skims the introduction. And honestly, 
Nowadays, that's what I do. But when I first started reading um, papers, I read it in a lot of detail because it tells you, do I know the background that I need to know to understand this paper? Um, and so this paper, this is about floral development. I am not an expert in floral development. So I started reading the, the, the paper. And in the first paragraph, they talk about the ABCDE model. Well, gosh, when I was a student, they taught me the ABC model. I didn't know what the ABCDE model was when I started reading this paper. So you know what I did? I Googled it, OK? <laughs> I Googled it, and I got this nice um, diagram. And it told me a lot about what I need to know. I know from the introduction, this paper is about B family genes. So A, B, C, D, E, these are all transcription factors. You can see these transcription factors are binding DNA. And you can see there's different ones. And the B family here, which are here. Oh, there's two Bs here, two Bs here. And then this is an A, this is an E, this is a C, this is an E. They're important for petals and stamens. So I should probably pay attention to petals and stamens in this paper. And then, oh, you know what? This flower looks a lot like normal flowers. Is this, what do maize flowers even look like? So I Googled that. And so here's an Arabidopsis flower. And then you can see, ah, there's maize flowers. Here's that stamen. So I should pay attention to these guys. And then the equivalent of petals in maize are these things that are called lodicules. So I should pay attention to that, OK? So here's an example. This is, you know, you don't need to know what a statement in a lodicule and a B-class gene is, but this just gives you an idea that before I even started diving to the results, I did a little bit of research and I had these cartoons. I actually drew that ABC model right on my paper so I could refer back to it. Okay. The next thing I did after reading the instructions, and this is probably the most important thing you can do, is figure out what is the question they're trying to solve here. And the in the nutshell does a great job, but sometimes you even need to take a big step back. So the big picture question that they have in this paper is how do different flowers have different morphologies? How does this happen? This is a huge question, right? There's lots of flowers out there. And then they break it down a little bit more specifically. How do genes that are conserved across different species, these same A, B, C, D, E genes, how do they lead to different morphologies? And how do these related transcription factor gene families lead to different form morphologies? Again, those are pretty general questions. Um, they also want to know how the interactions of proteins, remember in our little cartoon, there was four of those guys. How are they important for the floral development? And the very specific question, what they're actually trying to get at is this thing. How do variants of the floral B-class gene, sterile tassel silky ear, SDS1, and its binding partners affect maize floral development? And I drew a little cartoon right at the beginning. Um, they're only talking about these two B class, they're related, and they're talking about these things binding together. And so again, a lot of homework before I've even really started reading the paper. Okay, so now I feel equipped. I'm going to read the paper. Part two, the results, as Mary said, this is the meat. And so this is really the figures, the supplemental data, and occasionally I'll go dabbling into the methods if there's a figure that I don't understand. So I might jump back and forth. So here's figure one, and I already oriented myself, and I can say, yes, there's a lot of data here, including a lot of qualitative data. So I'm going to break this down, right? And so if we just look at this picture, you can see, OK, we've got different pictures. They're labeled differently. Um, STS1 head, what is going on here, right? So what exactly did they do? What is the experiment that they did? And you're going to have to read the text to this. So they tell you ahead of time that these SDS1 mutants, that's this one, do not have stamens. Ah, here's these anthers. You can see they're missing here. And they don't have lodicules or petals. And this makes sense, right? Based on that homework I did already, ah, these things should be affected. So what they did is they tried to rescue these genes, make the, the rescue these mutants, excuse me, make the mutants wild type again by putting in um, two different versions of this STS1. So this was in the, the background, right? Part of it is they knew that if they had STS1 normally, it partners with this other gene, which is called silky. Um, but if they mutated it, you could make it a partner with itself. And so I drew pictures of this on the paper, right? So this is the normal version. It heterodimerizes. And this is the mutated version that they put in, and it homodimerizes, binds with itself and nothing else. 
Drawing pictures is great. It's really going to help you understand what's going on, because even though the authors, you know, they're going to explain things, um, conceptualizing it is really important. Okay, and so the question that they're asking is, um, how did, do these two different versions, this normal version and this mutant version, can you get a normal looking plant again? So here's the mutant. And if you look, oh yes, they have anthers, they look fairly normal. And this mutant version also has anthers and it also looks quite normal, right? So <clears throat> that's great. And if they put this in another mutant background, so normally this guy pairs with its partner, Silky, and they put it in Silky, it's still mutant. That makes sense, right? So they asked a question, they have the big picture question, they have the specific question that the paper's asking, and now they have a specific question in this figure that they're asking. And I will write somewhere on the paper, um, on my iPad, if I'm using an iPad, or on a piece of paper, if I'm just reading it online, I'll write, ah, do these SDS1 versions both rescue the mutant phenotype? Do they look the same? They look pretty similar. There's more data here. I'm not gonna go through it all, but basically, I'll draw what is the question, I'll write down what is the question, and what were the conclusions for each figure. So in this figure, they found out, yep, this SDS1 is important for anther development. It can partner with um, this other guy, Silky, or it can partner with itself. In either case, the flowers look pretty normal, but there's a little bit of variation, and this is where the quantif quantification came in. There's a little bit of variation in morphology, depending on whether you have this guy or this guy, okay? So now that you have this, um, these conclusions from figure one, I'll go back to my big picture question. How does this specific result relate to the question they're asking for the paper? And how does it relate to this big picture question, right? So how do variants of this um, sterile tassel silky ear one and its binding partners affect maize development? Turns out you can have it partner with itself. You can have it partner with another B class gene, you get normal anthers, but maybe they're a little bit different. This is kind of cool, right? So here you can see, ah, it can partner with itself, it can partner with somebody else. Um, it might make things a little bit different, but maybe this is hinting at, oh, how you can get flowers that look just a little bit different, how evolution might matter, right? So relating things back to the big picture question helps you create a story and um, the, the thread of the paper, and this is gonna help you understand things a lot more. Okay. So now that we've answered one question, what's the next question? What do we wanna know? Well, we know from the paper that this thing is a transcription factor. So it seems pretty reasonable, and they introduce this in the paper, to ask if this thing is controlling gene transcription and you get normal anthers, although slightly different morphologies, do the genes that are expressed in these two things actually vary when, this thing, when SCS1 homodimerizes with itself or when it heterodimerizes? It, this is a reasonable question. So that leads us to figure two. And oh boy, there's those graphs. I don't know what these mean. <laughs> okay, so what do you do when there's an unfamiliar graph? And in particular, graphs usually tend to be the things that are the most confusing, right? <clears throat> okay. So this is what I do when I see a graph and I don't know what it means. The first thing I do is I just check um, the text and the legend. So in particular, the, the title of the legend, this isn't the full legend, it usually will give you the take home message of, of, the, of the figure, right? So B-class dimerization remodels transcription in developing tassel flowers. And then often, let me just flip to a paper, what you'll see, is we're in the results, there's these subheadings, okay? And the subheadings often correlate with different figures or major conclusions. And so you can see STS1 het and STS1 homo show subtle differences in localization and function. That's relating to figure one. Differential dimerization, so those are that, that normal version and that mutant version, of maize B-class proteins affect downstream gene regulation. Okay, this figure is about transcription, and it's about gene regulation. Um, this might be a part where I might flip to the methods and say, well, what did they do for gene regulation? I don't really know, right? Um, so it says, we performed RNA sequencing, RNA-seq in SCS1 or SI mutants. It says that right here. Oop. OK. 
okay? So I'll look at the methods and sometimes they're super helpful and sometimes they're super super technical. And so I'll look at this, it says RNA-seq tissue and I read this, oh, okay, they grew some plants, they isolated RNA, they did this deferential gene expression. Oh boy, this is a bunch of gobbledygook. I don't know what this means. I'm gonna go back. Let's go back to the figure. So I'm gonna go back here. So at least I know these are RNA-seq data and they're asking, what was the question, right? So sometimes, especially when you're new, you might not understand every nuance of the graph, but you can get pretty far, okay? The question is, do the genes expressed in flowers change when SDS1 homodizes, homodimerizes or heterodimerizes? So if you understand the question, it's gonna help you a lot <laughs> um, with the actual figure. Okay, so now let's look at these graphs, kind of big. What do I do when I have a graph I've never seen before? I know this is gonna be something about gene expression. Let's look at the axes. And this doesn't matter what graph you're looking at, looking at the axes will go a long way. So on the bottom, on the x-axis, it has log base two FC. We actually saw this in one of Mary's slides, really tiny. So FC stands for fold change. That's pretty intuitive, right? How much has this thing folded? How much has this thing changed? So if you take a logarithm of something that's changed twofold, um, that's gonna be the number one. If it's down twofold, it's gonna be minus one, right? So something that's unchanged, if you take a ratio, that's gonna be zero. So these are things that are more highly expressed and these are things that are more lowly expressed. Okay, so that's the X axis. What about the Y axis? Log 10 FDR. I don't know what FDR means. So I'm gonna Google it. I'm gonna Google FDR. And it says Franklin D. Roosevelt. <laughs> That's not very helpful, is it? Okay, gotta do a better job of Googling. FDR RNA seq. And then you can see, oh, Google's wonderful. What is FDR? RNA-seq, and it says, let me make this nice and big. It stands for false discovery rate. It corrects for multiple testing by giving the proportion of tests above the threshold alpha that will be false, po false positives. So a lot of technical information if you don't know what it is, but let's look for some key words. You see this word threshold, okay, um, and false positives. So this is somehow telling me whether things are real or not, right? There's some threshold and it's telling me whether things are real. Okay, so when I'm looking at this, ah, you know, you notice down here, log FDR, these numbers, or dots down here, these are individual genes, they're in gray. This stuff's colored. I think if you're high on the graph, that's probably better, okay? And this is something where, you might need to ask a colleague to help you out a little bit, but we've got pretty far just sort of breaking it down, right? The other thing you'll notice is I put A and B up here. They're pretty similar, right? So what's the difference between A and B? So we're comparing the mutant to the mutant that's been rescued with the heterodimer, and we're comparing the mutant to the mutant that's been um, rescued with the homodimer. When you're comparing graphs, check the axes. Are they the same or are they different here? And you can see, oh, these numbers, they're similar, but they're a little bit different, right? Here's 60, here's 40. If you look at the x-axis, actually these numbers go up a lot higher. And if you just take a step back and look at these graphs, really this is about comparing gene expression in this heterodimer and this is homodimer. This is the question, right? And if you can see, this just seems to be a lot more dots over here, right? So without knowing a lot, what I can say, look at these graphs, is we're comparing gene expression and there's a lot more dots that are high on the axis over here. So it took me a while to figure this out, but you know, I, I, I got there and this might be something where you ask a colleague or ask a friend, but I've taken this completely unfamiliar graph and gotten pretty far. So here's just sort of detailing what I told you. What is the question being asked? How does it tie into the big question? Check the legend, check the axes, refer to your methods, do some Googling, and if be kind to yourself. If you don't get all the way, if you get the gist, that's okay, as long as you can really relate it back to the big picture. And the more you read, eventually these things, are, you'll understand the details of the statistics, you'll get a lot better at it. 
Okay. So remember, we have this big picture question, right? And I think what I've learned from figure two is that this homodimer and these heterodimer, they're a little bit different, okay? And the homodimer seems to have more differentially expressed genes. So, okay, wait, <laughs> how does this relate to figure one? What, what was in figure one? Let's remind myself, oh yes, okay. Both of these different, the heterodimer and the homodimer both function normally. They both gave normal anthers, but they showed some variation in morphology. So if we think, how does figure one relate to figure two? What you can say is, ah, there's a slight difference in morphology between these two different things. And there seems to be more differentially expressed genes um, between the mutant and this homodimer. And how exactly are they different? Looking at this graph, it's really hard to tell. It's really, really hard to tell. And so the big data in particular, like transcriptomics and proteomics, you have to rely a little bit on the author to help you out, okay? So the text can really help here. And if you actually read the text, they have this quote where they say this SDS1 homodimer, um, the things that were differentially expressed were almost all related to chromosome assembly and protein modification. So there's a little bit of clue. If you're an expert, let's say you love, 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 love floral development and you know all the genes and you're like, man, I really, do I believe them? I wanna see what's actually different because maybe, maybe there's important things. So this is where the supplemental data comes into. And you'll see supplemental data sets like this and oh, look, there's that log full change and there's that FDR. These are the things that they plotted. And there's, oh, wow, look at, look at all the genes. There's thousands of them, okay? But maybe if you're an expert, this actually matters to you and you wanna look at it. If you're a casual reader, maybe you just take their word for it, okay? <clears throat> okay. <sighs> take a breath. What have we learned? How does it relate to the big picture question, right? We know that this protein can function as a homodimer or a heterodimer. You get slightly different fluoromorphologies. You can get slightly different gene expression. What's missing from this picture, right? We're talking about dimerization. That's protein-protein interactions. What about them? That's figure three. Okay, so you can kind of see there's this story or this thread and figuring out what the thread is and keep on pulling on it will really help you understand the paper, even if you don't understand every single figure. So I'm not going to go through figure three because we have 25 minutes. <laughs> okay, but again, you can see there's some quantitative data here, right, um, and there's these um, what we call co-IPs, Western blots, and this might be something that you're familiar with. This might be something you're not familiar with. Whenever there's a co-IP, I love to draw pictures, right, of how the different things are interact with each other. So take your time, break them down, it'll be fine. Okay, and so the conclusions, they thought, ah, oh, okay, these two different versions, this normal version and this mutant version that can only interact with itself, they have some partners that are the same, and some that are different, okay? Um, they also found this really interesting thing where they found out just the protein by itself, the, pro the, the homodimer seems to be more abundant, more prevalent, um, but the RNA for the other thing is more abundant. So this sort of is this disconnect between um, RNA and protein levels, which in biology means there's some sort of uh, regulation, um, post-translational regulation uh, on the protein level, and they, they took the next step and they said, ah, these things are ubiquinated. Okay, Ubiquina ubiquination is a way to break things down. So that's basically those three figures. That's the data. Okay. Whew. The discussion, right? So what the discussion is going to do is it's going to integrate all the results. It's going to integrate all the results of the paper together, which hopefully, if you've been paying attention, you've done already. Okay. Um, and it's also gonna integrate the results of the paper across the field. How does this, as Mary says, how does this piece of the puzzle fit into the big picture? Um, and is there a model? And I would say, in my experience, maybe half of the papers have a model. Um, if there isn't one, try drawing a cartoon on your own. 
it'll really help you understand things, right? Um, I can't emphasize how much drawing little sketches um, will really help you understand what's going on. So if we look at the model, okay, maybe this makes a little bit more sense now. So figure A, this is the, the heterodimer. This is what normally happens. And you can see, oh, these four little things, that looks an awful lot like those A, B, C, D, E model things, right? Um, and so sure enough, we've got the, the SDS1 and Silky, and they're saying, okay, it's gonna bind DNA, it's gonna bind other um, proteins, and then eventually it's gonna be degraded by the proteasome, that's why the protein isn't as abundant, okay? And here, they have a nice little model, and here you can see this is the thing that homodimerizes, it binds to a few extra proteins, it looks like, and this leads to a more stable protein, and you get more genes expressed. So they're linking together figure two and figure three by saying, ah, the reason why you have more genes expressed in this homodimer is because it's more stable, maybe because of the ubiquitination machinery, right? So we've put it all together. So this model really addresses things on the molecular level. Um, going back to this big picture question, how do different flowers have different morphologies? Okay, so we realized if you just have, it's a single mutation in this transcription factor, you change it a little bit, it's gonna change um, the stability of the protein and what other proteins it interacts with, which changes which genes are transcribed. And it turns out you get anthers that may be a little bit shorter and fatter, <laughs> okay? And now if you think about evolution, ah, how might you get a petal that looks like in a, you know, a maize petal versus an orchid petal versus a um, carnation petal, they look completely different. But you can imagine maybe how if you tweak enough things enough ways in different combinations, you can get this um, diverse flower morphology. So after you've gotten through and you've read the discussion, it's time to be analytical. And often I'll read a paper twice, at least, <laughs> okay? The first time, I'm just trying to understand what the heck went on. And then the second time, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna start picking. Like, is this the experiment really say what they said it does, <laughs> right? Is there a detail in the methods about how they did something that's really gonna change things? Are they interpreting their data in the best way possible, right? Um, so, I'll pick things, so those are all the holes, are the assumptions correct? A big one, right? A big assumption in this paper is by changing that one amino acid, change the dimerization between these two transcription factors and nothing else. That might be true, <laughs> it might not be, right? So you have to think about whether, does it matter? I don't know. So could the data be interpreted another way? The next, the other thing to do is to ask, what are the next steps? What are the next questions? What do you wanna know next? So for example, in this paper, they found maybe evidence that the stability of these proteins is altered. How is it altered? What promotes degradation of these proteins and why does it go differently? That might be a next step, for example, right? And then if there's any techniques that you're still confused by, this is a time to phone a friend, right? And that's okay. Um, if you want to cheat a little bit on some of these things, you can. So the, in a nutshell, at the beginning, the authors will tell you what are the next steps. So if we look at that, it's at the beginning. Background, question, that'll help you. Findings, next steps. Let's make this big so you guys can read. Um, next projects are focused uh, to explore mechanisms by which protein modifications and interactions affect floral order formation and evolution. That's a pretty general statement. In the future, our findings may help to find additional factors influencing, oh, okay. This one's not specific, that helpful, right? They do allude to this protein modifications, right? And I think that gets at that question of like, oh, why is one protein more stable than the other, right? Does it interact with different things? So that's a way to sort of cheat. The other way to cheat, Mary, um, alluded to as well. Not every paper has this, but I love reading the reviews and I won't read them until I formed my own opinions, <laughs> okay? But if you're not sure about things, checking the reviews and looking to see, well, what did the reviewers say? What experiments did they like? What didn't they like, you know? Um, is there anything in the supplemental data that maybe you missed? And then sometimes, this paper's a couple years old. If you go to Google Scholar and say, like, what did the authors do next? Who cited this paper? Has anyone followed up on it yet? You know, that's a good way, especially if you're doing this for a class, 
figuring out what the next steps are. Um, and so again, I just wanna end with be kind to yourself. I recognize that this is a big thing. And so again, I just wanna reiterate, the more you practice, the better you'll be at it. Um, and so with that, I'll wrap up and let um, you guys ask any questions. There we go. All right, thank you very much, Maria and Michelle, for your fantastic presentation. I hope that is very helpful for all of our attendees. So right now we are going to start the Q&A uh, se session. As a reminder, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Could be showing different language, language depending on your version of Zoom. Uh, so while we're waiting for new questions coming in, we already have a few re really nice questions. So for the first one is the your favorite format of reading. So I know a lot of people have different preferences, but what are your choose preference? Do you read online or do you print it out or do you read on iPad? And, and also how do you track, how do you take notes? So I'm curious to see what Mary says. My answer is it depends. So um, if I'm just reading something for curiosity, I'll often just read it online, save a tree. <laughs> Okay, if I'm going to read something really super in depth, I think part of this might be because I'm a little bit old. <laughs> um, but I will often print it out because I can write all over the paper. But I got less than a year ago my first iPad and notability is awesome. And you can essentially do the same thing on an iPad as you and then save it as you can with a piece of paper. Um, but sometimes I'll also just have like a notepad beside me um, and write even if I'm reading something online, I draw so many pictures, a little models, and so I'll just write it on a notepad. Yeah, I, I'm even older. <laughs> so, um, but exactly, if it depends on how deeply I need to understand it. Um, and I also am obsessive about drawing pictures. I think I became a biologist because we use so many little drawings to explain things and I love those and that's how I think. So I need to draw the little shaded bubble, you know, to make sense of things. Um, but if it's important and I need to like critique it, if I need to review it, or if I need to write my own summary of it, I will print it out as well. Um, I think that that highlighting, scribbling, all of that really is needed for me to, to fully grasp it. Good question. Next question about uh, keeping track of the papers. You must be reading a lot of papers every day. With that much reading and uh, learning, how do you keep track of what you have read and what you have learned from each paper? Well, there are lots of bibliography software. Some are free, some are not free. Um, I use EndNote, which I, uh, still has a cost, but I know a lot of people have moved into free things. So I'm sure Michelle has some, but I also download things and stick them in folders. <laughs> Often I don't read them and I download them and stick them in folders. In the old days, I used to photocopy them and stick them in folders. <laughs> I use Zotero, which is a free um, version. I used to use EndNote. And there's little places where you can put notes. Um, and then papers that I really need to read in depth that I know I'll come back to, um, I might save them. But honestly, um, I do a lot of rereading things. Like I'll read something, and then a year later, I'll be like, oh, I need to read that again. And you get different messages sometimes if new data comes out or if you just learn something new. And so, um, you know, it's part of your expertise. How do you remember what movies you've seen? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Okay, thank you for uh, answering. Uh, another question is that, um, where do you find the most important message of a paper? Right, where do you find the most important message? And so I think this depends a lot on why you're reading the paper and um, how close it is to your field. So some papers, usually the, the abstract will give you an overview, but the why are they really asking this question? Hopefully, I find typically that's in the last paragraph of the introduction. A lot of the introduction will sort of be preamble, um, background information, and then the last paragraph of the, of the introduction almost always will be the like, this is the thing that we have set out to learn. The first paragraph is gonna be, this is the whole big field question, right? And so those two things together, if the paper is well-written, will often 
um, point you in the right direction. Um, if you're reading it for a class, I hope maybe the professor told you why to read it. Like, you know, that, that'll help too. Um, the other thing to actually check also is very often, and plant um, cell and plant phys both do a wonderful job with, of this, is they'll have, um, oh, I'm sorry, can you guys help me out? The, the commentaries, the news and views. Yeah, news yeah. and news and briefs, yep. The in briefs. And sometimes that'll give you a lot of context about things too. Absolutely. And one thing I was going to mention, um, I noticed that one of the questions was about how do you know the impact? And yes, a few years from now, you can see who cited it. But if you click on the little alt metric circle, you can see what people are saying about it on social media and blogs and press releases. So I will sometimes um, see a, a paper where people are discussing it on Twitter. And I'll think, ooh, <laughs> what are they saying? And sometimes you'll say, this is the greatest paper I've ever read. And sometimes they'll say, ooh, ooh, something went terribly wrong here. <laughs> so that's a great way to find out what you know people in the discipline or, or beyond that are actually saying kind of in real time about the paper. Okay, um, and our next question is a little big, big, big question. Um, so, how do you train yourself for critical think for critical and constructive reading when you just started? I believe after so many years, you already got to that stage. But how did you get there? I've done it a lot, right? Um, I've read a lot, and so I think participating in journal clubs is really great. Um, for example, because there's going to be a mix of expertise there. And if there is a technique that you just don't understand, hopefully somebody there is familiar with it, right? Crowdsource that information. And then often, um, I'm going to, I'm going to actually raise my flag a little bit since we, we were, were asked about this, is I think that journal clubs can be really great for critiquing papers, but sometimes they can be too harsh. I think we like to train people to dissect apart every little single detail and then when things get to peer review sometimes people get a little bit nuts. And so I think asking um, what is the next question is a natural question to ask in journal club for example, but it doesn't mean it needs to be this paper, right? Um, we can't solve all the world's problems in a four-figure paper, but I think um, talking to other people about papers, when I was a graduate student, I would spend the first 15 minutes of the day just talking to different people. And I would say, hey, did you read this paper yesterday? Um, and we can talk about it. And so these casual as well as formal com conversations really help, but there's just no substitute for experience. Absolutely, I mean, it's like going to the gym. You just have to do it. Um, and journal clubs are a great example. There's online journal clubs. I think Prelights hooks people up. Um, just as a funny story, when I was doing this, putting this together, I discovered there's a an AI to help you read papers. I don't think that that's going to help you. I really do think you just like you can't get a robot to lift weights for you. You know, you have to put in the mental time, and nobody finds it easy at the beginning. I mean, it's it's overwhelming to be assigned a paper to read when you're a student, you know, and, but the next paper will be easier and the next paper, and then you'll start to see figures and recognize them like Michelle did. She's like, oh, that's a co-IP. I know what that is, right? So it's just practice. Don't give up. So come to our next question. So uh, you write in the paper, some, some of the authors will do over interpretation of their data as a reader, especially when reading some paper outside of your expertise, how do you find easy to spot those over interpretations? So this is a really important role for peer review right, when you're peer reviewing paper. And I told you at the beginning, if I'm reading a paper just for interest, I might take 45 minutes or an hour. But if I'm reading it for peer review, it takes me four or five hours. And there's a few reasons for that. One of them is you need to scour the literature and the papers they cite and say, you know, is this consistent? Because usually I think when people overinterpret res the results, um, there's one or two reasons for it. One of the big ones is that they will miscite previous work and the assumptions things are based on are just incorrect, right? And so you need to figure out what the assumptions are, right? What are the assumptions behind this figure and challenge them? And so a lot of that is just 
reading more. <laughs> okay, it's a lot easier to do when you're really familiar with the, you know, with the field. It's a really hard thing to do at the beginning. Um, the next thing that I do, and this, I would say this is, that's sort of, you know, advanced level, the intermediate level, not the beginner level, is um, there was a time when I just didn't read the results or the discussion at all. All I would do is read the figures, I would come up with my own conclusions, and then I would check, are my conclusions the same as their conclusions, right? And that's a good way of doing it, because that way you're not it's really easy to bias yourself if you read what the authors are, are trying to frame things around. Um, but again, just like lifting weights, there's no substitute for experience. And as you start to understand the techniques and the caveats and the pitfalls and the field, things will get a lot better. And if you're new, brand new to the field, sometimes you just might have to take their word for it. And a small question. Uh, some uh, someone asked. Uh, I, someone asked that if they lose interest uh, within the first half an hour of reading paper. So how do they? How, what are their tips to keep their focusing on the paper and keep reading? I know that can happen to a lot of people. <laughs> Take a break. <laughs> <laughs> Be kind to yourself. I think that's great. Great advice. Um, yeah, I. I always find whatever I'm doing, whether I'm reading or writing, um, going for a walk and coming back and then, or wash the dishes or cook dinner, your mind is still working on it. You're still digesting and you come back and you, you suddenly like, that's when you get the epiphany, like, oh, I was thinking about this all wrong. So when you just sit there banging your head against the desk, you're not being productive. So when your brain starts to shut down and it, the work starts to feel insurmountable, that's the time to just take a break and come back to it. Yeah, I yeah. think that is the best piece of advice. The other thing that I'll add is um, if you're trying to digest this all as technical information, it's really hard to pull the thread. But if you can find the question, find the story, um, our human minds are great at thinking and remembering and enjoying stories, but if it's just technical thing after technical thing after technical thing, it gets really dry really fast. And so um, taking a break, best advice ever, I would say second best advice is find the story. Okay, our time for the webinar is coming to an end. We're going to... Uh, answer the very last question. I find it's a very important question. So many people will have the will have the motivation to only read the papers from the high impact journals, but there are a lot of papers published every year. So what is your opinion about that? How do you choose what paper to read related really to your field? That's a really hard one. Um, it's a really hard question. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'll, I'll let Michelle start. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, <laughs> I guess as I've developed as a scientist, I just find that there's certain themes that I'm particularly interested in, and they're really independent of high impact um, publications, I would say. And so I have my Google Scholar page, and Google Scholar does a wonderful job based on what I've looked at before of just telling me what's come out this week. And so I tend to, you know, look those things up. And then, um, we have in my lab, we have a Slack, and we have a channel that's interesting papers. And so if somebody else tells me, recommends a paper to me, then I'll happen to read it. Um, and then I find there's other people who just are excellent storytellers who do excellent work, and I just read their stuff because I like it. And even the very best scientists will publish in Nature and Plant Cell and Journal of Experimental Botany and all of these journals, and they're all good journals and it's worth reading them all. Absolutely. I mean, and I said, I most papers, I only read the abstract. So that way I can read lots and lots of papers. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you all both for a very fantastic presentation. And thanks for the time for the Q&A. There are some questions we haven't got time to cover. We'll, uh, come, we'll put them in the PDF and uh, send to the audience later. Uh, and at the very end, here are some useful links you can check. We have our, uh, we have the uh, we have the previous presenting done by Mary Williams, post on Plenty web blog. You can check it out, and also check the website for Plenty Presence for our future webinars. Okay, thank you all for joining us today, and uh, 
yeah, thanks for the guest speakers. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, a very special thank you to our speakers and moderator. Have a great um, week um, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.